Excited to welcome Wyoming head coach Jeff Linder to share the game with us. Coach Linder led Northern Colorado to three straight 21 seasons prior to being named head coach of the University of Wyoming. Linder has posted an impressive 80 and 50 record in four seasons at Northern Colorado. He was named the Big Sky Coach of the Year during the 2018-19 season, leading the Bears to 15 conference wins for a program record. The Bears tied that record of 15 conference wins again in 2019-20. Over the last three seasons, Linder led UNC to the most wins during a three-year stretch in program history with 69 wins. Coach Linder, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, Chris. It's going to be fun to talk uh, about so many different things, but uh, let me start with uh, one of your famous basketball alumni, and that's uh, Ken Pomeroy. And uh, he said, in regards to you, the three-point defense with your teams may be the most unique thing with your coaching philosophy. And he went on to say that your defense is based on getting people to move in from behind the arc and not allowing them to shoot from three. And let's start from there, coach. That's a pretty good quote. That is a good quote. And I, I didn't, I didn't pay him to, to say that as well. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's one of those deals where I guess if you go back and you especially look at our stats at Northern Colorado, when I was the head coach there, and then what also what coach Miley continued to do last year uh, with a, um, you know, a team that been in that system for three or four years for us, here at Wyoming to um, implement that system during COVID with a brand new team and uh, starting three or four true freshmen at a time. Um, it was definitely a challenge, which with all things COVID, things were a challenge, but with a young team and, and not having the ability to practice, um, you know, really made it difficult, even though I think in the end, I think we were a team that was top five in the country uh, in terms of minimizing three-point field goal attempts. And I think the thing that we talked about at UNC and here is that, you know, our, our kind of number is 12. I mean, we want you at 12 attempts. Also knowing too that uh, a team, you know, that I, you know, my team is, I mean, I'm going to recruit shooting. And so we're going to average anywhere from 26 to 33 is a game. Now um, that just doesn't mean you're just shooting any three. Um, you know, we want to work for paint touch threes and rotation threes because we know based off the numbers that non-paint threes from a points per shot standpoint is, is a pretty low points per uh, points per shot shot. And so always fighting for good threes and then knowing going into a game. So my last year at UNC were the three years leading up to that, we were number one in the country and minimizing three attempts, which conversely we were number one in the country and not letting you assist on made baskets. So really we turned it into a one-on-one -on -one or two on two game and that team that last year, I mean, they averaged, a uh, team's averaged 11.83 attempts per game and made 3.33s per game. So now we're averaging about 28 three attempts. We're at making around 10 and a half. And so going into every game, I mean, I'm not a math major, but, you know, we're at about 30 to 33 points and the other teams at about six to nine. And so um, I think it's something that it, it, it evolved. And I think it's something that, Probably, you know, we've had to make some some adjustments and tweaks here at the University of Wyoming, because I do think when you're playing against a little bit, especially night in and night out. I mean, there's been some really good guards in the big sky, um, but um, in the Mountain West night in, night out from an athleticism standpoint, the bigs, it's a little bit different. So we're, we're going to have to make some tweaks. Um, our two point percentage defense was not very good here this past season. Um, but at the same time, I think at that level where the guards are not as athletic. And I think at all levels, guys are bad at making layups. You think layups were, uh, were easy, but uh, it's amazing how many guys miss layups. And so at that level, and I think even at the high school level, even more so, um, I think it's, it's a huge advantage if you can minimize three attempts. And I think it's also another reason to why we're such a good road team is that, you know, when you're not letting the other, you know, the, the home team get momentum based off of threes and that knowing that you're a team that makes threes, if you can just keep the game close, um, you know, I, I think it puts a lot of pressure on the home team to make shots. So we're going to talk some defense, but I know that peppered into all of our conversation is going to be the opposite side of the ball, because a lot of your defensive philosophy probably drives your offensive philosophy as well, correct? Yeah, correct. And, you know, I'm offensively, I mean, we're a team that's going to 
set as many ball screens as humanly possible at a, at a million different angles as possible. Um, you know, we've been one of the elite teams in college basketball in that area. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of what we do um, from an offensive standpoint also comes from what we do defensively. And um, if, you know, in practice, if we can find ways to get threes off on our defense, then we know we probably got a pretty good chance in the game. But I, I do think with the way the game's evolved, and luckily I think I've been ahead of it for the last 10 years um, in terms of spacing, uh, especially spacing at the college level. And I think that's where sometimes I think people, coaches make mistakes and they see the NBA in which, you know, the NBA, you got the best players in the world and a lot of the best coaches in the world, but it's a completely different game than the college game and what's played at the high school level based off the of spacing based off the, the defensive rules. And so that's, for me, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan and a big proponent of Europe. Um, the game's very similar in terms of where the three point lines at the defensive rules. And so I, I think a lot more can be taken from Europe. And so that's what I've done over the last, you know, 10 to 12 years is, is taking a lot of the things that Europe was doing um, and trying to incorporate them here, which I think over the course of time, since, you know, maybe the Spurs, which made it kind of popular. Now it's, kind of you see more of those trends but I do think in a lot of ways they're usually about a, a year or two ahead of everybody else and you start seeing those trends pop up in the NBA you know a year or two after if you're really watching Europe closely um, you know you kind of see them a year year and a half later. Yeah, that's such a good point. And uh, a lot of that innovation comes from necessity, as we've talked about before uh, with Europe and uh, just tremendous to study it. Logical to think the best way to defend the three-point line is to minimize the attempts. But this logic for you also applies to minimizing free throws and minimizing offensive boards. Yeah, I mean, ultimately it's, it's, it's a possessions game and, um, and knowing that, a team, that we're going to be a team that's going to be very skilled. Um, and so hopefully we can do a good job of taking care of the ball. But um, yeah, if I can minimize your three attempts and then if I can minimize – um, you know, your ability to get to the foul line. And I think that's something that even though I don't like to drill a lot, I do think that you really have to, especially early on and with your younger players, drill them how not to foul it and where fouls occur and where officials are looking for fouls. And uh, knowing that you can't have those unnecessary fouls that allow you to get, you know, allow the team to get to the bonus or the double bonus that much easier. And so, um, we really do, you know, we really try to teach our guys, you know, either by holding them accountable in practice to where, you know, those obvious fouls are going to be called or that in film, which is a huge part of how we teach because I'm a, a big believer of playing five on five um, in this day and age players attention spans are that about 144 characters so um, I really try to keep the talking at a minimum if you come to one of our practices I mean you're going to see 90% of practice being five on five, and you're not going to see me talking a lot. Um, and I think that's one thing too, when as a coach, if you're dominating practice with your voice, and as I sit there and tell our players that there's no reason from it, you know, it takes zero talent to be the best talking team in the country. It takes zero talent. Uh, but if, if the coach is always talking and um, it's hard for them to talk. And so that's where we want them to try to figure out and solve problems on their own. And so, um, that communication piece comes in big, not just, you know, from a defensive standpoint, but from an offensive standpoint as well. So I want to talk about practice and I was actually going to start there because I think some of the most practical things that I've taken away from you are some of these practice uh, concepts that you share. And you just mentioned this one, that one. So let's dive a little deeper. So you use video to teach rather than stopping and talking in practice and your practice then would involve you just short bursts of information, but then retro after practice, you're going to use the video to drive home the points. Is that what I gather? Yeah, you're, you're correct on that. And um, I think in this day and age, I mean, I know myself and I think everybody, else, I mean, I think you're, we're such better visual learners. Now, I also think, you know, which I learned hopefully at a young age too, is that you know, you minimize confusion too, if, which I always say to a lot of young coaches is you better make sure your language is on point and that everybody's speaking the same language in practice. So from a terminology standpoint on the offense and defensive end, if everybody's on the same page, and I think that's sometimes a mistake that young coaches make is that, um, you know, they got a head coach and they got three assistants and everybody's calling one thing, 
four different things. And then I think that creates confusion. But, um, but I do think that for us, the way that we work, I mean, 90% of practice, I mean, I'm, my goal is to be between 90 to 120 possessions of five on five in practice. Uh, that's the goal. Um, and then from there, um, you know, if you're going to do that within a, an hour and a half or two hour time, because if you're, if you're practicing five on five at that pace, you can't go longer than two hours. Uh, and so that's where we want to keep things is, you know, as close as possible in terms of, of that time frame, and, and knowing too, that over the course of the season, I don't want to wear them out as well. Um, but I do think that sometimes you know, I think where maybe early on as a coach, you feel like you have to drill, drill, drill. Well, I've seen a lot of teams that look good in shell drill, and then they get out on the floor and they have zero ability to just like offensively where you have to space, re-space, manipulate space. Well, defensively, your, your positioning is always adjusting. And so you can do shell drill and you can be good in a, you know, in a situation where you know where the passes are being made from. But when I'm getting 90 to 120 possessions in as a player in practice every day, now you're actually getting possession. You know, you're actually getting real possessions in terms of your positioning. You're getting real positions because knowing we're a team that ball screens a bunch where you're getting probably on average two ball screens of possession. I don't need to drill ball screen defense. Um, I think that's the other thing too, is when you drill a bunch, you know, from let's say a ball screen defensive standpoint, well, then it turns into a democracy and now, everybody's getting the same amount of reps. Whereas if I ask my players, especially my threes and fours, how many ball screens were you in last year? And they said, coach, not very many. So, well, what are they in a lot? Well, they're in coverage a lot. So if I'm sitting there playing five on five and I'm averaging 90 to 120 possessions, so that means we're probably around 120 to 150 ball screens being set of practice. Well, now the guys behind the ball who need to be elite in coverage are getting the amount of the reps to be elite. And then the guys that are on the ball and the guy that whoever's man setting the screen, now they're getting the necessary reps in terms of, of becoming elite on the ball. And so I think that goes hand in hand. And then conversely, the reason why my guards have been so good in the pick and roll in terms of numbers, um, wherever you want to get your number from, but if you go based off of synergy, which sometimes can be a little bit misleading, but you know, a point guard has been top five in the country the last five years in terms of their efficiency, in terms of points per possession in the pick and roll and the number of possessions in the pick and the roll. And I think a lot of that, and that's been a different point guard every year, is that now they are getting real reps of five on five every day in practice. And that's like the compound interest, you know, rule. Where now over the course of, a, you know, Jonah Radabaugh, who's a, a starting two guard for Ludwigsburg and the BBL that won the BBL last year, he didn't play point guard until his senior year for me, but he had three years leading up to that to where he was in that many ball screens in practice to where when the time came his senior year to be the point, he was number one in the country in terms of playing in the pick and roll. Well, I'm on board, coach. I mean, the five on five thing resonates and I love your rationale for it. And the other thing that I think coaches don't understand about playing five on five sometimes is it also gives you possessions as a coach where you develop game understanding, game decisions, because you're simulating essentially the game and you get more reps in those coaching situations. Yeah, you, you see the whole game as opposed to where you're just looking at certain parts. And um, and I think the other thing, too, is not it? And, and I, you know, I've, I've spent time over in Europe, um, and especially, you know, this summer. And it's funny because, you know, me being a coach that coaches five on five, and in one of and we want to be elite in terms of our spacing. I mean, spacing is a probably the number one um, priority for us offensively. And in order to teach that way, you have to play five on five. Uh, and then from that, from by playing five on five and being able to space, which a lot of teams can space the floor. Um, it's easy to put X's on the floor and, and get here, get here, but then they have the ability to re-space based off of where the ball screen is being set up, based off of penetration. But also, which I think the thing that I think most American coaches struggle with, and the question that I get asked a lot is, well, how do you get to that next action? And ultimately, by playing five on five and then your spacing will allow you to get to that second or third action. Because against the, the bad teams, you can score on the first action. 
But in order to beat the good teams and the really good teams, you have to find a way to flow to that second and third action without losing your rhythm or flow. And I think that's the that's the trick in terms of when you're playing five on five guys. Now, when they're just playing in space, they learn how to space, they learn how to re-space. And then hopefully my teams, they know how to manipulate space, whether that's based off the coverages, based off of whether we need to flatten the defense, stretch the defense, whether we need to cut. Those are the things that by playing that many possessions of five on five allows you to be a team that's hard to guard. I think late in the season, because you're not, just playing off a of set plays. Well, th- what stands out for me is that you're getting repetitions without being repetitive. And that's the part when you do a ton of drills or shell, as you said, it's very repetitive blocked repetitions where players are essentially memorizing a script as opposed to what you're doing, which is you're still getting tons of, for your example, ball screen defense and offense repetitions, but it doesn't seem repetitive because every situation is random and different. Yeah, and, and I think, too, is that with players nowadays, they don't play as much. They don't play as much pickup. And so there's they're so structured in terms of kind of how they've been brought up basketball-wise in terms of player development, in terms of trainers. And, and so you have to create those five-on-five reps for them. And um, I think that's where um, by kind of – where at UNC, maybe I was maybe practice wise, we were about 70, 75% five on five to where now at Wyoming, I think I'm probably at about 90% is that um, we got to create as many of those situations as possible. And I think too, with the, even with the younger team um, and now nowadays in college basketball, it's hard to keep teams around for four years to where you could just build habits over and over again. But I just think that, um, you know, when you're able to get, as I say, maybe yesterday in our workout where we got 144 possessions in. Now it takes a while as a coach to go back and watch all 144 possessions. But then now when my assistants are bringing in their position groups after practice or during the course of the week where we get a lot of our real teaching done is in those video sessions with the assistant coaches or with me to where now they can see you know, their positioning behind the ball in terms of the ball screen or how they have to adjust here or there. Um, And so then that's where the video side of it comes in and plays a huge part in what we do. So such a great point about creating five on five for for players that don't do it on their own as much as they used to. Uh, Coach, I know there's some people that are listening going, okay, well, short bursts of information in practice, that's great. But then how are you getting your coaching interventions and your coaching points across? Can you take us what a video session looks like that helps you do that to be able to save time in practice for actual basketball practice? Yeah. And I think with, for us, um, you know, the way that we do it, I mean, we'll break up with my three assistant coaches. I mean, we'll break them up position group wise based off of guards, wings, and post. Um, I'll kind of be the one that overlooks it all and, and have a, you know, maybe if a guy comes by, hey, here's five to six clips. And I, and I think it depends on the day. I mean, we don't want to just overload them. And I make that a big point with my assistants is that, you know, we don't want to bring them in and show them 30 clips. Now, there might be a day where maybe or after a game where they might need 20, 25 clips. But if we can get our point across within, you know, eight to 12 clips based off of what we saw that previous day, um, I think it goes a long way. And I think the other thing it does, too, is is from a you know, I think it's a overused word, but from a culture standpoint, um, it always, it forces the players to come to the office. And so it, it forces those players that maybe don't want to come by the office all the time. It allows you as a coaching staff to get, get touches with the players. And I think that really goes a long ways. I mean, that might even be the, the biggest uh, thing that we get from it is just the ability to making sure that the guys are always coming by the office. Well, and there's also an efficiency of time and active learning time for the player because you're making these individual clips and you're making them specific to the player. So they get what they need out of it in a shorter time. Not saying you don't do group film sessions, but this is probably more impactful for the individual learner. Yeah, no question. And that's where, especially as the season goes on, and and, and if we do show film to the team, if it's not from a, a, a scouting standpoint, I mean, we're going to show those clips on the floor. I just think that as I've done this long enough and just seeing, like, if you bring a team in before practice, 
you know, they kind of got cobwebs in their eye when they're making their way out to the practice floor. So if we're, if we're going to show them film, it's going to be on the floor. It's going to be no longer than probably eight to 12 clips. And then we can make our way to practice. Um, and that's, I said, it's just, it's a huge, it's a, it's just what we use the most. And, um, and luckily I said, we have the, the, the capabilities, the technology and the staff to do it. Uh, but I, I do think that it's the best way to teach. So another takeaway that I think is tremendous and what coaches should uh, try and figure out how this fits into their philosophy is that, and speaking of scattering report, you label players in practice with your scattering report terminology, snipers, drivers, or players, so that they get used to guarding different positions. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so, you know, going into practice, and so our guys are just mindless and knowing that we want to practice the way that we actually play in the game, I mean, we'll – We'll basically have a, a board up on the on the in the floor like a rolling whiteboard, and um, you know we'll have each player's last name, and then based off of that day, we'll we'll label them accordingly, whether they're a player, sniper, or driver. So from that, so they they always have to be thinking in terms of okay, well, who am I guarding? And understanding that for us in practice, if a sniper gets a three off, you know, unless it's a an awful shot, um, regardless make or miss, that's three points. And so now they understand the importance of that, that guy, that sniper. Okay. We have to do everything humanly possible to minimize his three point attempts. And I think the other thing that that helps us too, is from a transition D standpoint, where ultimately we know in the first eight seconds, if we can minimize those three attempts with the first two passes, then we're going to have a pretty good job of minimizing those three point attempts in the next 22 seconds. And I think that's a lot of times, though, off a missed shot transition or turnover transition, that's where, if, okay, if you're not just completely dialed into the scouting report, knowing who's who and what's what, because you're, you know, transition-wise, and that's why I think two-on-one, three-on-two is a waste of time. And, and when we do transition, I mean, we're working four-on-three, five-on-four, five-on-five, because ultimately those are the situations you see in the game. But in transition, if we can minimize those three-point attempts, especially to those elite shooters. I mean, we really feel good about in the half court that you're going to have a hard time getting off a three. Well, I love that you said that coach. I can't, I can't agree more that the, a lot of the traditional two on one, three on two drills are a complete waste of time. Uh, they're too scripted. They're too organized. And that's not how transition happens. Is it? I haven't seen very many situations <laughs> where you come down in a three on two, you pass it to the wing and then you follow your pass to the elbow and they pass it back to you. And you pass that. We just don't have that much time. I, I just know we have about eight seconds to where we can put out the fire. And if we can put out that fire within the first eight, then we're going to have a really good chance. And I think the other thing, too, is when you play more, you know, if you go, if you're transition wise, four, three, five, four, I think it also it helps you develop your spacing and understanding, too, where for a team like us who wants to get threes off as early as possible, knowing that the good teams that can get their defenses set. Well, our spacing has to be right uh, in order for that to happen. And also, too, it also teaches our guys to make the easy play. And, um, you know, we want to try to hit as many singles as possible and try to minimize the home runs. But I do think when you, you play more of a four, three, five on four, it allows you to get more game situations and game reps. Well, I think we're starting to understand. I mean, you're just trying to do as much as you can to give your players context that happens in the game. And that, that's obviously tremendous. And, uh, the other thing you mentioned there is about transition. You talked about shot clock. And uh, that's another thing that I've taken away is that a lot of your transition drills, it's really specific what type of shot clock you put on them to be able to make that drill realistic. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And, you know, for us, I mean, we know from a, you know, just from a, you know, statistical standpoint, and I mean, it's, it's the first eight seconds is in transition. Now, hopefully if we're giving up, any shots off a made shot trans made shot transition. I mean, it's all five players on the floor are going to have hell to pay for, but um, off of missed shots, turnovers. I mean, we know it's eight seconds. So in a lot of the drills that we do, I mean, we're going to go eight seconds in terms of, let's say we're going, you know, two trips down the floor. I mean, that first eight, we're going to go for eight seconds. And then if, you know, we get an, a rebound or if it's a make or a miss, then we're going to push it back with 30 seconds. But we just know, and so the players know that those first eight seconds and how important they are in terms of us um, 
be able to get back and, and establish our, our, our defense. And so that's where I mean, I do think that, you know, having that eight seconds, it just gives them a sense of urgency. And then I also think too, from an offensive standpoint, uh, it, it makes you realize too, that you can get a good shot in eight seconds, um, that eight seconds is not a lot of time, but it's enough to where we don't want to just come down and shoot a pass ahead three. I mean, I know from our numbers that, you know, the, the pass ahead three down the floor is a really, really bad shot. Um, but we got to minimize the rotation threes and the paint touch threes um, and try to make sure that we're giving up as few of those as possible um, in those first eight seconds. Well, and bringing that back to defense as well, that your transition drills mimic how you are potentially going to give up threes in transition as well, don't they? Yeah, and that's where, um, you know, knowing that from a, a three-point standpoint, the threes that we give up in transition, I mean, a lot of those are going to come off of turnover transition, um, missed layup or block shot transition, uh, where a lot of those turn into number breaks for the other team. And so that's where we spend a lot of time on trying to make layups, uh, you know, try to make it a, a big point of the importance of not getting your shot blocked, which I think too, where for us, a big thing is, is playing off two feet. And that necessarily doesn't mean playing off of um, the jump stop, but more so stride stop, back stop, you know, back foot pivots, um, and especially when you're playing against better players. And I think sometimes, People think because you're close to the basket, it's a layup. It's a good shot. Well, for some guys, especially when they're attacking their weak hand, um, that's a low percentage shot. But also knowing, too, that if you can get the ball in the paint, which is ultimately our number one job offensively is to create as many paint touches as possible, is that by driving and knowing that teams nowadays are really good at taking away the strong side three, but the, the power of getting down where you're driving hard, getting the ball below the free throw line down towards the block. And now if you don't have a shot and you're playing off two, well, the defense naturally on the backside pulls in and they lose vision. And so now if you're respacing behind the ball, that's a way to create threes nowadays when teams are so good taking them away from the strong side. So uh, Practical, there's there's more than just the numbers. And I want to spend some time on the practical things that you do, which I think can really help coaches. But we probably have to start how to defend the three-point line conversation with understanding how do teams get their three-point attempts, which I think is one of the most valuable things that you've shared with coaches. Yeah, and, and the way that we kind of break it down is that one, you know, transition, two, um, positioning. So in terms of usually when you're one pass away, uh, in terms of what your responsibilities are, um, and that's where knowing who you're guarding from a scouting report standpoint, but it's amazing how many times, um, you know, when you're one pass away and you're guarding a guy where, you know, if I have, you know, if I have guys that are all six foot six to six foot eight and I'm long and athletic, well, guess what? I can do both. I can be in the gap. I can be there to stop penetration and I could probably get out to a really good contest. Well, at the end of the day, you know, where I've been at as a coach, I haven't had the luxury to have all those guys. And so you got to kind of pick your poison. So what are you going to be? You're going to be a gut team that's going to take away the gaps or you're going to be a team that says, okay, well, yeah, there's certain players. If they're a driver, yeah, you're a no split, but then, okay, if you're guarding a guy that's a player or a sniper, well, you're a fan out. Now that doesn't mean we're just going to go hug our guy. We still want to make sure that we have early visual help in the gaps. We want to make sure we're showing our length. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep our flat triangles, knowing that if our triangles are deeper, then that's when we're going to get in trouble. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, yeah, I'd like to have both. I could have, to be able to the length and athleticism to do both, but I don't think that that's necessarily the case for most teams. And so now you kind of have to pick your poison. So from a positioning standpoint, um, you know, can we do a good job? And then guarding the ball. Um, now, I think at most levels, I mean, you're not playing against Lillard or Curry where I know when you put the ball on the floor for probably, if we're playing 30 games in a season, we might run into three or four players that have the ability to shoot a pull up off the bounce and make threes at a high rate, especially now where the three point lines at. I mean, I think that makes it even more of a, a lower number. I mean, I know from a pull up standpoint, teams that we had played against for the last five years. I mean, that number is probably around 19 to 21, between 19 to 21%. And then from a ball screen coverage standpoint, you know, can we turn the game into a two on two game? And, um, 
And so then you have to get really good in terms of the guy on the ball being able to be tough enough to, to fight and get back in front of the ball. Now, if he can't get back in front of the ball, not being scared to where we call it a wall and crack. Some people call it, you know, a veer. Um, but then you got to be really good in terms of understanding those situations. When that ball gets below the free throw line, if as the big, if you see that the guard's ball is not in front of the chest, I mean, that means that you're going to have to the wall up and we're going to have to crack back. And so, you know, from a ball screen standpoint, if we can turn it into a two on two game, you see so many teams where if they're guarding a really good shooter in the right corner, you're coming off a, a corner fill ball screen to the middle and you have guys tagging off. And that's the one pass that everybody in America drills. I mean, most guards can make that snap or shake pass back to the corners. So, yeah, if that's a non shooter, yeah, we're going to tag. But if that's a non shooter, I mean, if that's a shooter, we're we're going to make sure that, you know, we're going to make you play going to the middle and we're going to turn it into a two on two game. And so those are some of the ways in terms of minimizing attempts and then knowing rotation wise, you know, we don't want to get beat to the outside. Uh, if you get beat to the outside, we know from a points per shot to the baseline, when I say outside, we're going to be giving up um, a pretty high points per possession or points per shot. And so we hope to, to make sure we minimize those attempts. And then, as we talked about defensive rebounding wise, I think defensive rebounding and rebounding is a habit. Um, I think when you're not the most athletic team where you can just go chase the ball or just use your athleticism, you have to build those habits to be an elite defensive rebounding team. And um, that's something that you know, I took a lot of pride in from my time at UNC, my time as an assistant to being an elite defensive rebounding team. But those are habits that you have to build because if you're giving up offensive rebounds, we know that the highest percentage three are the dagger threes that come off the pass out. And so, you know, it goes back to what you emphasize. And for us, that the habit of every time a shot goes up, you're checking. I mean, we need to see on film a visual of you checking to see whether your man's going or not to where that turns into on the perimeter, a check and chase situation, or if you're near the basket, a hit and get situation. Well, just on that point uh, and jumping ahead maybe, but uh, when you, when you contest, you also want players to take two hard steps back to the ball. And that's another part that's driven your defensive rebounding philosophy. Yeah. So it's, yeah, we say contest to two hard steps. Um, Cause it's amazing how many times when that shooter misses, it comes right back. And then you're just sitting there, which early on our, our, our new guys, I'll say, you're not the statue of Liberty. They'll just sit there and contest, hold their hand up in the air. Um, but that's also too of, of making the effort. It, it takes, it takes a little bit more effort to make those two steps back. Now, maybe if there's some people that believe, Hey, you can run that guy out. Maybe you can get an easier three down the floor creating you know, an advantage that way. But for us, um, ultimately knowing that basketball is a game of possessions, uh, we're not going to be probably an elite offensive rebounding team, just the way that we play in terms of being more four out and setting a lot of ball screens. And so we got to minimize your ability to get extra possessions on your offensive shots. And so that's where we have to be elite in terms of our defensive rebounding and the habits that we develop uh, rebounding. Another cool understanding I developed from hearing some stuff that you talk about is clearly, and this makes sense when you think about it with your transition defense, if you give up, th you give up threes from your threes and because you shoot a high number of threes, this is a danger for you that you have to learn how to obviously counter. Yeah. And I, I think too, when you're taking the right threes, um, usually you can make sure that you can get balanced going back on the defensive end. But um, I think when you shoot bad threes or the wrong guys are shooting threes, um, that's where for me, I mean, I, I really define who who's allowed to shoot what shots. I'm not, I'm not scared of confrontation when it comes to shot selection. I mean, we're a team that's shoots as, as few of, you know, as few of non paint twos pull up twos is probably any team in the country. Now, if I had a player that made that shot at 60, 70%, yeah, he's going to be allowed to shoot that shot. But I think for us is, is defining, you know, your role in terms of shot selection, defining your role in space. I mean, I think that's the other thing is that when you're trying to respace or you're trying to adjust space based off where the ball screen setting at, the defense is going to tell you, I mean, they got a scouting report too. And so for our players to understand, okay, based off of where the ball screen is being set, knowing that, okay, if the defense is guarding us a certain way, if we need to create the advantage somehow, some way, we might have to move space. It's not just a matter of just standing. 
um, which, hey, if you're a 50% three-point shooter, yeah, you can stand in the slot in the corner. But if you're a 25% three-point shooter, well, guess what? You might have to move the slot. And so I think understanding, you know, your role in space, your role in terms of shot selection, and I think five-on-five five builds that too, especially when five-on-five five is competitive because guys don't want to lose because they don't want to run. And so now guys realize, well, if I'm, that shot's maybe not – they, they end up turning those shots down. And so I think also the benefit of five on five is, is helping you define those roles. It's great stuff. And uh, I love hearing this and uh, going through more of your defensive teaching points. Uh, one of your phrases, which I love is your position is your help. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So that goes back to, um, you know, being in the gaps, one pass away um, is that, you know, your position is your help is the, you know, it, it kind of sounds easy in theory, but it's it's hard to to apply every single possession, especially against good offensive teams. But if your position's right, ultimately everything else takes care of itself. And I think that's the biggest thing with younger players that when you really go back and watch on film where your mistake came from, it's ultimately your position. Um, you know, whether your triangle was too deep, um, you know, whether you were hugged up to your man, and so I think for the younger players to realize that that's a lot of times is where their mistake is going to come from and let, and, and, and if you don't show them, especially film and it's, you can stop them on the floor, but if you're stopping them all the time, I mean, it's just, you're not going to get much done in practice. So that's where for us in terms of using film, in terms of, you know, technology, in terms of creating a snapshot on your screen of, of, of their positioning and then having them showing them like, Hey, listen, where should you be? And I think that's another way, not just through video, but the ability to take photos of video and being like, okay, before practice, hey, Noah, here's three photos. Tell me what's wrong or what's good. And it just gives them another way to figure it out. I love it. And um, going through to now, I think positioning, but also guarding the ball, you talk about stick hand or and modifying that relative to obviously scouting reports, sniper, player, or driver. Can you take us through each of those, how you would cover the ball with this stick hand philosophy? Yeah. So in terms of, you know, we want, and I think the other reason too, why we were you know so good is, is that we want to minimize you know, from an offensive standpoint, we want to create as long of closeouts and rotations as possible, but from a conversely, from a defensive standpoint, I want to minimize rotations and I want to minimize the length of closeouts knowing that usually as you go down in levels, the ability to guard the ball is one of the biggest things. And usually a lot of those mistakes happen or a lot of those blow buys happen is because of the length of the closeout. So for me, knowing that maybe, okay, I, I'm going to recruit a lot of guys that can pass, handle, and shoot. Well, they might not be as athletic. And so now can I make them more athletic by minimizing the distance of their closeouts um, and so now when we're one, you know, one pass away, um, or if we happen to be in a rotation because we get beat to the outside, if you're guarding a driver, okay, yeah, we don't want to close out outside the three point line. We want both feet inside the three. Uh, if we're guarding a guy that's a player, we want to have a stop sign on the ball. So if, if I raise my hand up and I showed my palm, I'm right there, knowing that that player probably is going to hesitate for a split second where they can beat you off the bounce or then they decide to raise up and shoot. And then if you're guarding a sniper, a guy that we know, if he puts the ball on the floor, that's probably an advantage for us is that we don't want him to get that ball. Um, he can't get that up into a shooting pocket. So we'll have our hand when we close out on top of the ball, knowing that you know we're not playing you know guys that are in the NBA that can manipulate that and, and bring their arms through. But that's where, you know, we want to know that that guy who's a sniper, we do not, we do not want that ball being raised up. And I think that's the one thing, especially at my time at UNC, and if you'd ask teams that played against us that had somebody on the other team that was labeled as a sniper, um, it was really hard for them to get a shot off. Clearly, based on the numbers, yes, uh, very effective at what you're doing about minimizing attempts. And uh, the other thing that I think is unique, and, I, and I'm guessing this comes from your study of Europe a little bit, is that for a lot of pack teams, they won't ever go into situational denial. Situ and you do use that, where you'll go into certain situational denial on certain players. Yeah, and I think it's in terms of, you know, based off of who we're playing um, and knowing, too, that um, 
especially from an offensive standpoint, as I, as I tried, as I told a, a group of coaches at a coaching clinic this weekend, is that of, of the teams that you play, I mean, really, how many guys can really guard the ball on the ball screen? I mean, there's so few guys, maybe one or two on each team that can actually are tough enough to push up, defeat the ball screen or fight to get back in front of the ball before the free throw line. And, um, and I think that's where if you can find, can, can you find those, you know, offensively, why am I going to allow, why am I going to, why am I going to have my best offensive player fighting against your best offensive player all game long? Um, and so that's where, you know, from an offensive standpoint, then from a defensive standpoint, well, why am I going to let a guy that maybe is your primary ball handler, the guy that makes your offense go, well, why am I going to let him get a clean touch all night long? I mean, well, I'd much rather turn it into a four on four game. Or now if you have a dominant post player who's really good on the right block, well, why am I going to let you just catch the ball on the wing, on the, on the right wing all game long and feed it to him? And so I, I think that's where I, I think Europe is very, they, they are more, um, you know, I, probably whether the right word is, but they're just, they're really, they're a lot more flexible in terms of their defensive coverages based off of personnel. It's not just one set thing. I mean, we're going to guard every guy differently. And then hopefully having the players that are capable of doing that. And if you do that in practice where guys, you have to figure out what guys do from a, a scouting report standpoint, understand how you're guarding certain guys based off the ball screen, and you're making guys actually think that way in practice, then it's going to allow it to be easier to implement that and do that during a game. So the other part that goes with this is obviously your emphasis on minimizing three-point attempts puts more value on you developing your players to be, to be able to take away the two and defend the two because they're more likely to be in more situations where they defend the two because of your philosophy of minimizing the three. Yeah, and that's where you know we have to be really good in terms of we say win the first dribble. Um, and hopefully when we're minimizing the length of our closeouts, it's going to be easier for us to win the first dribble. But knowing, too, that um, if we can force you into non-paint twos as opposed to paint touch twos or restricted twos that are coming at the rim. Um, but I also, too, we got to know that, OK, when, when that guy puts the ball on the floor, that we don't want to foul as well, knowing that you know, we have to go stick hand to no hands on the first bounce. And then knowing that once that ball gets inside the three point line, probably on that second or third dribble, we can ride the dribble a little bit more with that form. You know, back in the day when you played pickup and you played a lot of five on five and then the summer times when you played one on one, you knew how to use your form to help you, you know, create and you know, to help you get back in front of the ball as, as, as a defender. Well, guys have no idea how to do that anymore. And so but you also have to know, too, on the pickup that you better show two hands because that's where the official, if they see that one arm on there when that offensive player is picking the ball up, that's where you're going to get a foul. And so now you got to be able to show two hands and then you got to build a wall um, on that pickup and then be able to, you know, not foul. And I think that's something that you, you have to drill, maybe not as much as just one-on-one. -on -one, Cause I think, you know, for me, you can either guard or you can't guard now, if you're put in situations five on five in practice, you got to figure it out. But, you know, the same guys, if you sit there and waste 20 minutes a day playing one on one in practice, I mean, the same guys that can guard guard in practice are the same guys that can guard in the game and the guys that can't guard in practice. They usually can't guard in the game as well. And so um, if we can find a way to just help them find a way to win the first dribble and then help minimize the fouls that come from guarding the ball, then we'll be a lot better off. For sure. And uh, at least coaches think that you're doing just a ton of shell drill to develop, to be able to develop this philosophy. You mentioned you didn't like shell as a player, so you don't do it as much as a coach. So what do you do instead is play five on five. And most of this is developed through, I imagine, emphasis that your players know exactly what you want. Yeah, they know. Yeah, they know exactly what we want. Um, now, maybe early on for the first few workouts in the summertime, especially the younger players. I mean, yeah, we'll do you know, closeouts versus coaches. And we're talking about, you know, whether we're going close out to dead, understanding how we push up on a dead dribble or close out to contest, knowing that we stay down, we don't leave our feet until the offensive player leaves his feet to where we're not fouling jump shooters, but knowing too that when he does leave his feet to contest the two hard steps, 
um, you know, whether or not we got to explode. But, you know, it's one of those deals, too, where coaches say, you know, jump to the pass. Well, how many times do they really jump to the pass in a game? Um, now, there's certain guys, yeah, you want to jump to the pass, too. And there's some guys you might not want to jump to the pass, too. And so it's, it's always evolving, always adjusting. But I think I know that we're always going to be really good offensively. And if we can find a way to guard us five on five somehow, some way in practice, uh, we're going to have at least a pretty good chance to guard most of the teams that we play. Well, coming back to offense, uh, and you talked about this, uh, about running a ton of ball screen in practice and the benefit. And one of the benefits is the value of the pass is that your players have learned through that and through game based play, I imagine. Uh, that you value not turning over the ball, but they also get those repetitions of decision-making to learn how to not turn over the ball in these ball screen reps, don't they? Yeah. I mean, those you're, cause you're getting real reps uh, under real circumstances and real situations. Um, and they know that, okay, when we drive baseline, that we have a plan for when we drive baseline, we have a plan when we drive middle, we have a plan when we drive hard to the middle um, and we're looking for the pull behinds. Um, but when they get that many reps, they understand how to keep the floor space. So now you can make the extra pass when you create an advantage. Um, and then just emphasizing, you know, emphasizing the extra pass. Um, and that's something that we build into our shooting drills as well. Um, and it's not just shooting drills for the sake of shooting. I mean, it's based off of baseline DTB shooting, middle DTB shooting, pull DTB shooting, swing shooting. So those situations where it's not just incorporating, um, just the shot, but the pass and the situation that's going to lead to that shot. So it's just not shooting for the sake of shooting. And so I think everything we do is has a purpose based off the situations that we're going to see in a game based off of our penetration off of driving or based off of us attacking a ball screen based off of your coverage and knowing when we put you into rotation uh, or we put an odd number on the ball that we're going to be able to get the shot that we want. And we've, you know, and we've repped that, not just the shot, but the pass. I love it. And uh, I'm imagining, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this with your development of this philosophy defensively about taking away the three, what have you learned about getting threes? Um, you know, I think it's where against goes back to, can you get to the second or third action? Um, and then can you, as we say, can you identify the coverage can you embrace the coverage and then can you attack the coverage? And I think that's something that for our players, they know that we're going to have a plan for, for us. I mean, there's six different ways you can guard a ball screen. Now each, each coach is different, but in terms of whether you're going to be at the level of the screen in, in a lateral or a flat, whether you're going to be in a drop, whether you're going to be in an ice or pushing the ball screen down, whether you're going to blitz or hard show the ball screen, are you going to switch the ball screen? Or are you going to go under? And so I think for my players, I mean, they know that we have a plan for those situations. And then now when you're playing that many reps in practice and you're also mixing up your coverages in practice, because I think sometimes people think that, okay, because if I, if I don't, if I don't work on my coverage, my base coverage all day, every day in practice, that means we're not going to be very good at it. Well, well, now offensively, you just you learn how to attack one coverage or two coverages. And so now over the course of a, a 90 to 120 possession practice, if I'm mixing up our ball screen coverages to where now my players have to think and adjust accordingly. Now, in terms of us being able to flow to that second or third action, um, now it makes it that much more easier in terms of being able to create those threes off of rotations or based off your coverage you know just so much practical and uh, as i said logical and i'm yeah. imagining again logical thinking is what's driven all this for you hasn't it yeah there's no question i mean it's just in some ways common sense but if you're crazy like me and you watch as much film as i do i mean that's that's how i got to this point it wasn't because i was a great player or this that or another but just by watching so much film and then i think also too it just I think when you communicate to your players in terms of, you know, what they're seeing and, and the ability to really get their opinion and, and knowing that their opinion matters to where they can talk to you about, because as I'll tell them, Hey, I'm not the one playing. So sometimes, because for us offensively, I mean, we'll, we'll be different every year in a lot of ways based off our personnel. And so maybe something that might think, 
hey, I watched Tenerife do this. And then I think, okay, maybe this works for us. Well, then you realize, oh, maybe it doesn't work for us. And so having that back and forth dialogue, but, but I do think, and that's where, you know, asking you, cause you've done it for an entire season and I'm not sure if you did it even any more after that or why you did it, but that's where I just think the value of five on five. And I think too, that your players, they just, they enjoy practice so much more as opposed to just when you just drill, 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 and drill, it's just, it just gets old. Yeah. And coach, I did it for those reasons. I did it for the players. I mean, just for player satisfaction. Uh, I wanted them to enjoy the process of getting better and through practice, but also like from a collegiate perspective, recruiting, like, isn't it a lot easier to go to a player and listen, Hey, you get to watch a practice of yours and they watch you practice and go, wait a minute, I get to play basketball in practice. It's gotta be exciting for a recruit that comes to watch you. No, not exactly. And that's where like at UNC, when you'd come and watch a practice, I mean, that was a huge separator for us was the, just the energy and just how much more they enjoyed practice. And then when, your guards have had the success that my guards have had in, in the offensive numbers. Now I don't have to lie in recruiting because here's the, here's the video to support it. And here's the, here's the numbers to support it. So then that's how you go. Now that's how you're able to get a little bit better player than what maybe you're not supposed to get. Um, but now how, how long when you were going five on, I mean, how long were you on average, how long were you going? So there would all be again, situational segments set up and then, what, what people come and don't understand is that you can manipulate intensity and you can manipulate yep. duration clearly with the number of trips you play. Yep. And that would be the main way to be able to segment the difference between teaching and testing. And we tended to play less trips if we were teaching yep. and more trips if we were testing. Yeah. And that's where, you know, when I, when I went and watched Tenerife, which, you know, I would go over there and travel 22 hours to get there and, you know, choose the head coach. I mean, he's, I mean, they play, I mean, they 95% of practice was five on five. And that's where him being a guy that's big on spacing, he's like, there's no other way to coach unless you're going five on five. And so for me, where some coaches would be like, oh man, I came all the way over here to watch. Well, for me, that was the best thing I could have seen, I saw was them playing five on five and knowing why they play five on five. And, you know, where it goes back to where he would go half. So they would start, they'd go about eight segments. They'd go half. And then they go half full, then they go half full, full, and then they come back to half. And maybe now we're starting from a baseline OB situation or a side OB situation. Then they go half full and then half full, full. But then I think the other thing for me, which, you know, going back to five on five, you could tell me, I'm not sure how much you did or what is it. You can do half, half full, half full, full. But when you go for four minutes, you put four minutes on the clock and scrimmage. It's, it's amazing how much different it becomes for the players. And, and then trying to keep those, that discipline and effort that you can do in terms of a one trip, two trip, three trip setting. But now can you do it when it's five on five for a four minute stretch? I mean, for coaches who don't do that at least three to three to four times of practice, I, I just think you're, I think you're missing the boat, but I could be wrong. Well, I don't think you're wrong, coach. I agree with you. And, and that's what I refer to as testing time in that sense that you're, you're letting your players play so that you have an opportunity, as you already referred to with video and different things, that these interventions in those examples don't need to happen in the moment. They can happen later. But in those other examples, you're more likely to get more, well, quicker interventions if needed to be able to develop it. Coach, I can't thank you enough for uh, being a part of the podcast and sharing the game. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the time and um, look forward to hearing more of your episodes and appreciate what you're doing for the game.